Hello, everybody. Welcome to our media briefing on understanding sea level rise and the modeling of, of sea level rise. I want to just uh, give a quick moment to introduce you to Cyline so you know who's bringing you this media briefing today. Cyline was created just last fall. It's uh, an editorially independent operation located at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. It's funded completely by philanthropies. And the sole goal of this operation is to help reporters who are covering uh, stories on environment, health, and science. And um, we uh, do that in, re in response in part to a trend that I think everyone's familiar with in journalism today, which is that newsrooms are shrinking, specialty reporters are shrinking as a core, more and more science stories and health and environment stories are being done by reporters uh, like many of you uh, online today who cover big beats, who are not necessarily specialists, um, and who could use some help getting the evidence and the expert sources that you know can be so important to make your stories better. Um, especially given the increasing deadline pressures that everybody's under today, doing sometimes two or three stories a day instead of instead of just one. So our goal is to get more evidence into news stories and to help you do that. One of the ways we do it is to provide a matching service where if you are working on a story, you can get in touch with us, tell us what kind of uh, expert you need. We have a huge database of scientists who are very good in their fields and good communicators and we have a concierge service of sorts that will hook you up with the expert you need to help you get more evidence into your story. We also do news briefings like this. We've got fact sheets that we're starting to populate our website with and some other services. So um, you can check out our website at sideline.org and learn more about what we're up to. Um, the issue of sea level rise and the modeling uh, that goes into trying to understand sea level rise is the perfect kind of a topic for what we're seeking to do here. It's one of those things that uh, seems to be of great potential consequence, but it's also an area of a lot of confusion. So we'd like to try to clear that up since it's important and confusing. Um, I think we've all heard that sea levels are rising, and we've all heard that climate change seems to be um, one of the, if not the major reason, that sea levels are rising. But uh, I know for myself, um, that the details about that can be uh, confusing and it's hard to know what to make of it. We hear stories about millimeters per year, which frankly doesn't sound like that big a deal compared to the size of ripples washing up on the shore and the waves and the tides. But I also have read that, you know, if Greenland were to melt, that's uh, 20 feet of sea level rise. And it seems like things are melting fast and Antarctica is a lot bigger than Greenland. So what to make of all that? Um, I know I'm mixing some frozen apples and thawed oranges here, but the basic idea is uh, we ought to be straight as reporters how to talk about this um, and not make the mistake of feeding into climate denial or making the mistake of feeding into being what some people have come to call climate bullies um, and or maybe you know feeding into the worst crime of all, I think, which is this namby-pamby false equivalence that uh, comes up a lot where equal space is given to people with weak science. So to help unpack all this and to make sure that, that you all can write clearly and accurately about this topic and inform the public and decision makers about what the facts are and what we know and what we don't know and how we know it, we have four experts today with uh, great credentials who are going to explain this to us. Uh, I'm not going to go through the full bios with you right now because they're all available on the web landing page that you folks have seen. But I'll just give you the batting order, and that is that you'll first hear from Michael Oppenheimer of, of Princeton, who will give an overview of what we know today about sea level rise and about the models that scientists use to understand what's happening, because it never hurts to have the basics spelled out authoritatively. Next, you'll hear from Andrea Dutton uh, from the University of Florida, who will take us back in time to talk about the paleoclimate and how studies of climate and sea levels in the distant past can inform and allow us to calibrate our models and predictions today. Sophie Nowicki of NASA Goddard will tell us what's happening with the world's major ice sheets today and how all that feeds into the modeling and prediction process that we've been talking about. And finally, Ben Strauss of Climate Central will tie all this together miraculously, help paint a picture of the take-homes that you want to have, including maybe literally the take-homes, like what's going to be happening to some of our homes and hometowns um, in the years to come and what to make of all that. Um, so 
With that, let me just turn it over to Michael to get things started. Thanks again for joining us. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to give you some general points about sea level rise consequences, and then let my colleagues here give the details. Sea level rose about six inches during the 20th century, mostly due to anthropogenic climate change. We, uh, we know this from flotation devices near the coast called tide gauges, as well as global scale satellite altimetry measurements. We also know that over the preceding centuries, long-term ups and downs of sea level generally followed changes in global average temperature, and Andrea will talk about that a little later. Six inches might not sound like a lot, but it's enough to permanently narrow the typical East Coast beach by about 50 feet through erosion and submergence. Recently, the rate of rise has accelerated from about six inches per century to about double that, more than an inch every decade, a foot per century. We know why global sea level rises, due to the way warming affects ocean water and ice. First, ocean water, like most fluids, expands when it's heated. Second, mountain glaciers melt when warm. Third, the large ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica melt and disintegrate into the ocean when warm, either from warming from above, from the atmosphere, or warming from a warmer ocean below. Currently, these three sources, expansion of seawater, melting glaciers, and disintegrating ice sheets, contribute about equally to sea level rise. In the future, we expect the ice sheet contribution to become the largest factor. And that's a great concern, because uh, just the, uh, the vulnerable parts of Antarctica and, Gre and the Greenland ice sheet contain about 40 feet worth of sea level rise. The harder part is projecting sea level rise into the future due to uncertainties in our understanding, especially with respect to modeling of the two ice sheets. And Sophie will have a few things to say about that later. But we are certain that additional sea level rise is baked into the system regardless of future greenhouse gas emissions because of various lags in the system. The time it takes for emissions changes is significantly slow warming. The time for heat to penetrate deep into the ocean waters. The time for ice to warm and melt. Stabilizing sea level would take centuries under even optimistic emission scenarios. So emissions reductions, even rapid ones, as envisioned <laughs> under the, for instance, the two degree global target, don't make a very big difference uh, to sea level uh, until after mid-century. But for subsequent decades, the sea level rise difference between low emissions and high emission scenarios becomes very large. IPCC's fifth assessment said that by 2050, global average sea level could rise by more than a foot compared to year, what it was in year 2000. By 2100, these numbers increase to as much as three feet. Some recent literature published since the fifth assessment report foresees an even faster and larger rise. New projections will be forthcoming in September 2019 with the release of IPCC's special report on oceans, cryosphere, and climate change. In addition to submergence and erosion, the effect of sea level rise is felt most notably during the surge that accompanies coastal storms, like hurricanes or nor'easters, and also during high tide. Sea level rise means that even if storms don't strengthen with warming, their surge will push water further inland than previously, causing much more extensive flooding. For example, by 2050, floods that now occur once every 50 years in, for, let's say, Charleston, South Carolina, could occur more than once every three years, uh, more than a factor of 10 increase in the frequency. For New York. For New York City in year 2100, floods that now occur once per century, and which in the past have shut down the city, could occur once every, almost once every other month. Hurricane Sandy doubtless caused significant additional uh, damage up and down the northeast coast than it would have if it had arrived a century earlier, even if the city looked the same because it was riding on a higher sea level, and I think Ben will have some things to say about that later. Tidal, and nuis or tidal or nuisance flooding, as it's sometimes called, which is less damaging, 
translate that as flooded basements rather rather than running to the nearest shelter, but which occur much more frequently than the large storms, uh, have also increased markedly. Areas like the Carolinas that formerly experienced such flooding only a few days a year now experience it, it up to 40 days a year. And Ben can also comment on, on estimates for the future. I'll close by reminding everyone that our history of defending infrastructure and people against coastal flooding is not particularly encouraging. We're always playing catch up, fighting the last flood. In the meantime, sea level rise and flood heights are only going to increase in the future for the foreseeable future. This is a battle we are currently losing. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for that inspiring uh, ending. Uh, I think actually potentially truly inspiring. Uh, it's good to know that something needs to get done if it does. Uh, let's move on to Andrea and take a look back in time and see how that contributes to the issue. OK, thanks. So I'm a geologist, and I study past sea levels. So I often get asked the question of how looking at past sea level has really any relevance to the conversation that we're having here today about what's going to happen to sea level in the future. So today I'm going to answer that question for you, and I'm going to share two different stories with you. The first is about what we have learned about future sea level rise by looking into the deep past. And the second story is about some work that I have gotten involved with more recently, looking at uh, sea level rise over the past century using records from tide gauges. So first I'm going to tell you what we've learned about sea level rise by looking at past warm periods in Earth's history. And as Michael mentioned earlier, one of our largest uncertainties is how these large polar ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica are going to respond when we're thinking about projecting changes in sea level in the future. So to answer that question, one thing we can do is look into the past, because to some extent, the Earth has done some of these experiments for us. It has been warmer before. Those polar ice sheets have retreated. And so we can look to those examples to see how much they retreated under warming and how quickly that happened. When we're modeling into the future, one of the challenges we have is we've never been around to observe that particular process before. And so we don't have a full understanding of the physics involved in that ice sheet retreat. And that's why we need to go into the past to uh, put some constraints on that. So I'm going to talk about a period of time about 125,000 years ago. And so this is before the last ice age. So in the last ice age, we had large ice sheets advance over, for example, North America. Sea levels dropped because a lot of that water was tied up in the ice sheets. And before that, there was another warm period we call the last interglacial. And the best estimates we have right now of what the global average sea level was during this time period is about six to nine meters higher. So that's about 20 to 30 feet higher than today. The reason that finding is really important is that the global average temperature at its warmest during that time period was about the same as the global average temperature today, although the poles were a few degrees warmer. But those are temperatures that we are destined to reach in the poles in a matter of a couple of decades. So why is this important? It means that if you had that much warming during that past time period, we saw a significant retreat of ice from Greenland and Antarctica. We can, of course, get some sea level rise by melting the rest of the mountain glaciers. And also, as water warms, it expands. Those two factors, though, can only give us about one meter of sea level rise. We know that the Greenland ice sheet retreated partially during that time period, contributing maybe something about two meters of, of average sea level rise around the globe. So to get up to six to nine meters, or that 20 to 30 feet level, we really would have had to tap into the Antarctic ice sheet. And that's something that you may have read about a lot in the news, is that people are concerned about what's going to happen, particularly in the West Antarctic ice sheet, which is thought to be most vulnerable, because a large section of that ice sheet is based below sea level. So it's susceptible to this ocean warming that Michael talked about before, and it could retreat very rapidly because of the physics involved there. So OK, that happened during that one time period. but. Was that a fluke, or is that a repeated experiment? So we've looked at several past warm periods over the last 3 million years, and we saw repeatedly that sea levels rose by at least 20 feet 
with anywhere from uh, 1 to 3 degrees Celsius of warming, where each degree Celsius is about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's um, a 1.8 to about 5.5 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a repeated experiment that we see over and over again. Now, the good news about this is that that type of sea level rise is not going to happen overnight. We're not going to wake up tomorrow to dramatic flooding. Right? As mentioned before, it takes some time for that ice to heat up and to respond to that. So I often talk to people about it's kind of like throwing an ice cube into a warm room and watching it melt. And you can think of these polar ice sheets as if we've thrown them into a warm room. And now we're sitting back and watching what's happened and how quickly they're going to melt. That is one of the remaining big questions to answer, though. How quickly will this process unfold? And that is a very active area of research, one, in fact, that my own research group is focused on at the moment. We do know something about the volumes of ice involved, though. So the West Antarctic ice sheet I mentioned before, if we were to collapse that marine-based portion of it, that would lead to something like 5 meters or about 16 feet on average around the globe. But there's a spatial pattern to that sea level rise. Some areas will be higher. So if you're on the US East Coast, unfortunately for you, you will see a greater amount of sea level rise there um, if that meltwater comes from the West Antarctic ice sheet. So how does this help us to improve our projections into the future? The same models that get uh, run into the future to project how the ice sheets will respond are also run during these past time periods. So I work closely with these modelers, and they try to get their models to fit the data that we're producing based on our observations of what happened in the past. If they can get their models to fit our data, then they have a better constraint on the physics involved, and they can use that physics in the model to help make a more robust projection of how sea level rise will unfold in the future. So in other words, they're using our data to calibrate those models that get used to do the sea level projection. How does this help us address uncertainty and plan for the future in communities dealing with this? A lot of people focus on the uncertainty. I mentioned there's some uncertainty about how quickly that inner ice sheet will retreat. But look at the flip side of the coin. We are certain that sea level rise is going to continue to rise and that what we're looking at now is just the first step in a very long journey. So what we need to do is kind of redefine our relationship to the coastline as it continues to evolve and march landward. The second story is a little bit shorter than I'm going to tell you today, and that's about the work that we've been doing with tide gauges. And we have been focused and specifically looking at the region along the U.S. Atlantic coast. And I got involved in this <clears throat> because from the years 2011 to 2015, we saw a dramatic acceleration in the rate of sea level rise south of Cape Hatteras all the way down to Miami. And we saw about five inches of sea level rise in five years. So you heard some numbers before three millimeters a year, the global average rate of sea level rise. That equates to about one foot per century, as Michael said. And all of a sudden, we got five inches in five years. So what caused that to happen? It turns out there is some natural variability in the rate of sea level rise. It will have some short-term accelerations. And people have referred to these as hot spots of sea level rise. The name is it's a little bit of a misnomer. Nomer, it has nothing to do with the temperature of the water, but just that it's a focused area where you see an acceleration of sea level rise. And it's due to natural variability that we see between the ocean and the atmosphere. Part of this is due to the El Nino cycle, and part of it is due to something that we call the North Atlantic Oscillation, which looks at the pressure of the atmosphere on the surface of the ocean. It acts kind of like a seesaw over the North Atlantic Basin changing the ocean currents and causing the water to pile up against the US East Coast. So <clears throat> what we found is that these rates of like five inches per year were not unprecedented if we look back over the last century. And so this is a natural variability on the system that will superimpose on the gradual sea level rise that um, is projected into the future. So how does that change our projections in the future? We need to prepare for the fact that we could get these short-term, multi-year accelerations in sea level rise. So we need to plan for having an envelope around our sea level rise projections, that we could get these short-term accelerations. But we're going to, it's most likely, we're going to be unable to predict exactly when those are going to happen. So it's just something we need to build in as a buffer as we move into the future. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Super clear. Um, Sophie, tell us what you're up to in Antarctica. 
Hi, so I'm an IT modeler and I uh, use models to make projections of the future sea level in the time scale over 100 years, roughly. And before we start, I just want to remind us that 100 the time scale is actually not so far. Um, I've been very fortunate to have my grandmother um, to live uh, up to the age of 105 years old. She just passed away this, uh, this winter. But we just celebrated the five years old birthday of my uh, youngest son. And so it meant that for many years I had to deal with um, a difference in generation over 100 years. So when I think about the 100 year projection, this is something that my children might get to see. So what does it mean, I mean, using a model? What is a model? It sounds a bit scary, but actually, you know, you use model every day, all the time in your life. Um, for example, when people, when bridges are being built, you, just don't, you don't just build a bridge and then let trucks go along it and then hope that the bridge doesn't collapse, and then if the bridge collapses, build a stronger bridge. Now, you use actually physics and mathematics to basically design the best bridge. That is, and the design that you're using is basically reflects the condition on what you're building your bridge along. So, if have, so then if you need to have a bridge that has many roads, you make it a different way, and yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, a bridge. Bridges are being built uh, based on a robust set of physics and mathematics um, that takes into account all the factors that are important. And so for ice sheet models, it's just the same thing. You know, we build an ice sheet model based on what is important for ice sheets in terms of physics and mathematics. So currently, um, we have about 13 ice sheet models that are used to make projections of future sea level rise. Uh, nine of them are being coupled to, um, ice, to climate models. And there's about five models that are really being developed uh, in the US. They are different. And why are they different? Well, it's because usually when they've been created at the start, they might have had a very slight different interest. So for example, uh, the ice sheet system model built at NASA JPL um, is really designed to make the full use of the observations that NASA collects. But then you have another ice sheet model called the community um, assistant model that's basically being built to be coupled to the community um, uh, system model. And so it has very different needs, so different flavors. But at their core, all of the models use strong physics and mathematics that um, we know can be used to describe uh, the highest behaviors and its interaction with uh, the Earth system. And by the Earth system, I mean that the ice reacts with the atmosphere, the ocean, and the solid Earth. So what do we know about ice sheets? And when I build a model, well, we know that they grow due to, due to snowfall. Like, so if you dig, if you go on an ice sheet and you dig um, a snow pit, or if you fly with a snow radar over an ice sheet, you're going to see those like very thin layers of snowfall um, each year. And so the, the, with the youngest layer being on top of the ice sheet and then as you dig deeper, or you see deeper with your radar, the ice layers are being older. Just like when you know you cut a tree uh, and then you cannot count the tree rings, Basically, this is, you can see you have those layers that tell you how old the tree is and how fast the tree grew. Well, we can go back with a nice sheet and kind of count the layers and kind of see how much accumulation has been in the past. Um, and so, but you shouldn't think also of a nice sheet as just being just like snow falling and nothing, making this big massive snowball and nothing happening. Basically, a nice sheet, um, actually is a very dynamic system. Um, it flows, just like if you were making a pancake, and you're making a pancake on a pan, you know, you put the, the dough in the middle, it's going to spread slowly towards the edge, edge of your pan, making a nice circular pancake. Well, I should behave that way. They're just, you know, you model them as a fluid that flows very slowly. How fast the ice is going to flow really depends on what's at the bottom of a very thick ice. Um, if the ice um, and the interior of the ice sheets, usually the ice is um, flowing over a really, really um, hard bedrock and it's frozen. And so again, it's like very, 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 very slow flow. But as you move towards, as the ice moves towards, uh, it spreads towards the continent, towards the ocean, it starts flowing over sediment or over water. And it forms those rivers of ice. The, ice sheets making ice streams, and basically the ice flows very, very rapidly and can take speed of the orders of kilometers per year. So what else do we know about ice sheets? Well, we know it's crack. It can crack, it can make a like, massive um, iceberg. Um, a good example is uh, the one that uh, was formed uh, last year in 2017 from the Pine Island uh, Glacier. It was the size of Manhattan. 
there's a big chunks of ice that cracks. Um, and when, and after an iceberg calving event, observations of ice thickness and ice velocities tell us that the ice inland starts to speed up. So now we also know that um, um, ice can lose mass um, at the surface of the ice sheet, um, but it's in, you know, just at the top of the ice sheet, basically where um, the temperature gets really hot and so you can have the, the snow can melt at the surface. Um, and also um, ice basically um, also loses mass um, over the, when it starts flowing over the ocean because the ocean can start melting the ice. So basically um, ice sheet grow because of snowfall, it spreads towards the, the coast and towards the ocean, they will lose mass by iceberg calving or by melting underneath the ice shelf or on top of the ice sheet. Um, and so a lot of our knowledge of ice sheet is basically behavior is uh, linked to the observations that the satellites have made or the observations that we've made uh, on the field just by people walking on the field being snowpit. Um, and um, as new processes are being implemented, we basically include those into our model. So what do we know not so well about projection? Like why are there so many models and why when you're going to read something, the numbers are going to be different? So I think basically anything that happens underneath the ice sheet um, is we don't really know because basically the ice sheets are so thick that if you can't really, you can't necessarily be able to see what's underneath them. And so for example, we don't really know where the ice is basically frozen and sticking to the bedrock or where the ice can flow rapidly over soft sediments and pass. Um, or we don't really know when you have the surface, you know, when you have water that's melting at the surface, we, we can see there is crack on the surface and that water can go deep into underneath the ice and reach the bed and make the ice flow faster. But we don't really know how much of that ice goes and how much, you know, what is the true effect of this water reaching the bed, making the ice easier to slip away. Um, finally, I mean, we, other examples is that we, we don't really know the shape of uh, the bedrock of where the ice uh, flows um, over. So with, uh, as part of Operation Ice Bridge, it was a NASA campaign that um, and basically flight aircraft. And one of the things that they were able to see with the radar is the shape of the bedrock wherever they flew. And so in 2013, they flew over a glacier in northern uh, Greenland, and they discovered a canyon that was the size of Grand Canyon or bigger. And what it meant is that this canyon was able to kind of, um, it could reach from the, in that ice, that the canyon could link the, the ocean to the interior. So it meant that if something happened at the boundary where the ice basically met the ocean and the ice decided to collapse, if it does, then now basically the, the ice sheet can basically go back, 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 back inland, it cannot be stopped. And that's something that we didn't know two years ago until we had those measurements. Another good example is for an Antarctica is to get better knowledge of the bed. There's a recent study that shows that using two different bedrock can lead to a difference of 20% of future sea level rise in the 100 years. And in that study, 20% was 0.1 meters. So the bed really matters. And unfortunately, the bed is hard to see. And so basically, some of the uncertainty in our sea level projection is just because we don't know what the bed looks like. Um, another good example is the ice ocean interaction, when the ice sheet uh, floats over the ocean. Um, we, again, we can't observe it. It's very hard to observe underneath this ice sheet. And so um, ice sheet modelers uh, make um, good models. We try our best to make a model about how the ice and the ocean interact. And so a few years ago, there was like three studies of our three glaciers that gave quite different numbers. And the only reason that they gave different numbers on how Thwaites was going to react in the future was just the way that the, the, that the modelers wrote the equation about how the ice and the ocean reacted and interacted. Um, so, um, and um, another good example too is basically iceberg kelvin. We know that the ice cracks, but it's really hard to actually implement that into a model and it's really hard that like, we don't really have a good understanding about what causes this ice to crack. So there is, so basically there is lots of factors that we don't really know how to implement in that model. Um, but um, the thing is that whenever there's a factor that we don't really know how to implement, um, 
I should model it, you know, we pay a lot of thoughts on trying to describe that process into a model. And so we might get there a different way. And you shouldn't be, if we, how am I going to say that? If there is, um, you know, if we all get the same answers, it means that the process that we're trying to describe that we don't really know is really well captured into our models. But if we all get a very different answer to a response of the same uh, process, then it means that we just have more work to do to try to understand this process better. And this work will be helped with that we also need to have more observations or more people uh, doing experiments in the field or in the lab. So the finally, one of the factors about why it's so hard to make projections of future sea level rise is because us humans have an impact, that has an impact on future climate. And we're going to impact what's the choices we make every day are impacting how much the oceans and the atmosphere is going to warm. And that's something that as myself, as a modeler, I have to try to uh, incorporate into our model. Thanks, Sophie, for clarifying a lot of the factors that go into uh, understanding all those variables and reminding us that we are uh, behaviorally one of those variables. Um, ben, why don't you uh, bring it home? Perfect. Thank, thanks so much, Rick, uh, to be here. Um, so I, I thought I would start trying to recap uh, some of the main points from Michael, Andrea, and Sophie. Um, to begin, We've seen around six inches of sea level rise over the course of uh, the 20th century, and that's a global average. Uh, local, val local values vary, but about six inches, which is more important than it seems, uh, and I'll, I'll return to that. We know in terms of looking toward future sea level rise that ice sheets, the ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica are going to be key in the equation. They hold the vast majority of potential sea level rise. And we know from the um, kind of long-term ancient uh, geological evidence that those ice sheets are extremely sensitive to changes in temperature. So that uh, temperatures similar to today or very slightly warmer are uh, associated with sea levels that may have been 20 or 30 feet higher uh, in the past. It is much harder for us to project how quickly sea level will rise uh, as compared to how much it will rise. Uh, one thing is to look back in the record and see the kind of resting place sensitivity of how high the oceans might get compared to a given warmth, but we can't resolve that historical record down to the decade level that's interesting for our projections today to give us guidance around how quickly sea level might rise. Uh, and even if we could resolve the historical record that well, of course, conditions then were a little bit different uh, from conditions today. And we have tremendous challenges in understanding how the ice sheets will respond in detail uh, that Sophie described. Uh, these are um, massive formations in very remote and harsh locations where we have relatively little data, uh, almost no long-term observational data. Uh, to, to develop uh, kind of trend lines and the sense of behavior over uh, multi-decade or century time scales uh, in recent time. And uh, it's very expensive and difficult to make observations. The uh, ice sheets move slowly. Uh, we don't have the benefit of being able to run experiments, um, except for the one that we're running right now on a, on a planetary scale. Uh, so there are a lot of challenges. Uh, and a lot of reason to uh, focus our attention there. Some research and researchers on um, and looking at the West Antarctic ice sheets suggest that while today uh, those ice sheets are contributing on the order of you know, inches per century to sea level, there are certain thresholds that can be tripped after which we might expect them to contribute feet per decade uh, for a short period as basins <laughs> em empty out once uh, basically ice dams and blockades have been removed and the flow of, of glaciers and ice sheets into the ocean can be, uh, would be released and speeded. So now I want to put this into context of, a little bit more context of what it means uh, for people who live on this planet and near the coasts. And first I thought I'd take a global perspective very briefly. Um, if we could show the first slide, uh, there's a map of the globe and I, that, um, 
It was published in the New York Times several years ago based on analysis that I did with colleagues. And the point here is not to look at the details, but rather the, the size of the squares indicates the number of people living on land that could be permanently inundated or subject to chronic flooding by the end of the century. And you can see that on a global scale, this problem is very strongly concentrated in Asia. Five out of six of the world's people who live on vulnerable land live in Asia. And that's a great concern in terms of um, prompting uh, migration over time and instability in the region. Of course, um, I have to put an important caveat on that research. If we move to the next slide, it's based on um, a global elevation data set that is extremely poor and which is another source of uncertainty in our understanding of the impact of sea level rise. Fortunately, we have much better elevation data in the United States, and the panel shows two pictures. Um, land less than five feet above the local high tide line is in blue. Um, on one side, uh, the right-hand panel, I think that's, that's more filled in. That's based on high-quality laser range finder data called LIDAR taken in the United States. And on the left panel is the satellite-based data that we use for global research and, for example, for those numbers in Asia. And you'll see that much less land area appears to be affected. And the reason is that the satellite-based data that the entire research community uses to understand global threats and threats in Asia are uh, measuring treetops and building tops and averaging those into uh, ground elevations. So on average, uh, the elevations are two to three meters too high in the coastal zone. And we're talking about one to two meters of sea level rise uh, in this century. So that error is actually a major source of uncertainty that we have not really invested in or focused on. And unfortunately, the um, direction of the arrow, we, we understand quite clearly that as we improve elevation data, we will, we will come to see that many more people are at threat than we currently recognize. Moving into the United States, um, I want to talk about some of the other factors um, in, in, uh, that lead to local impacts. There's a lot of variation in the rate of sea level rise. If we move to the next slide, you'll see um, kind of recent sea level rise rates historic sea level rise rates from around the United States as, as tracked by uh, NOAA. And um, there are many causes for that variation that you should be aware of if you're doing a local story. In some places, in particular, the land is sinking. In other places, more rarely, particularly Alaska, the land is rising. But in Louisiana, in the Chesapeake Bay area, and in fact, in much in, in, in those two areas, land is sinking particularly fast, and in many other areas of the United States is sinking slowly. Over the last century, those sinking rates were in places comparable to sea level rise from uh, uh, you know, climate change and, and global warming. But in this coming, in, in the current century, we expect the rates from due to warming to dwarf the rates from uh, sinking land in most locations. Another um, factor that affects how a locality experiences this threat is simply the pattern of topography and, and uh, development relative to that topography. So you have major metro areas like uh, in South Florida, which are on very flat, very low-lying land with high population density. And then you have in Southern California, Los Angeles, which uh, has a lot of topographic relief. It's much hillier and higher. So very simple but quite important in determining the threat locally. Another less appreciated factor is the importance of the bedrock uh, under a city uh, or geography. In most, in most cases, the bedrock is solid and uh, largely impermeable. But in South Florida, unfortunately, most of the bedrock is porous, like a sponge, so that even if levees were, protective levees were to be built, uh, water would penetrate underneath those structures and come up through the grounds, making making defense measures much more difficult uh, in that geography. Um, I should also add, um, moving to the next slide, that sea level rise very much amplifies the effects of coastal flooding. 
And that's really how we're ex experiencing sea level rise most today and will in the coming few decades, making coastal floods more frequent, higher, more destructive. So uh, our colleagues and I are currently working on research uh, in, that indicates that uh, a, a significant fraction of the damages from Superstorm Sandy can be linked to human-caused sea level rise, those last few inches. And looking retrospectively, and this connects to the uh, chart that you see in front of you, we uh, counted up the number of coastal floods at 27 tide gauges around the United States since 1950 as they occurred. And then we subtracted out human-caused sea level rise to see how many would have occurred without that effect. And it, in fact, it's two-thirds of floods at those 27 tide gauges would not have been classified as floods without human-caused sea level rise in our analysis. Uh, our sea level rise tipped, really we're talking about minor floods, but it tipped them over the balance for something that would have been just high water to something that the National Weather Service locally defines as a flood event based on their local observations of roads flooding and infrastructure impacts. So even a few inches is already having, it's already shaping this um, exponential growth curve in the frequency of coastal floods that you, that you can see plainly uh, in that graph. And finally, an important factor in uh, what impact sea level rise will have, besides how much more carbon we put in the atmosphere, is how we respond uh, in the places that we live along the coast, what we, what we do in our cities and rural areas in terms of developing defenses uh, accommodating more floods or, re or retreating uh, from rising waters. So um, I think, uh, and I, maybe I'll wrap it up by giving a very brief tour around the United States to give a sense of exposures at just a couple of elevations. If you look at the state level, uh, populations on land less than half a meter above the high tide line, California actually has the most. So this is an elevation range where we, we can expect this much sea level rise in the second half of this century at some point uh, under almost any scenario, uh, with about, about 85,000 people in California live less than half a meter uh, or 1.8 feet above local high tide. Only around 63,000 people in, in Florida live on that land and around 31,000 people in Louisiana. And I'm excluding people who are protected by levees that are in place. Otherwise, the number in Louisiana would be much greater. If you jump to one and a half meters, which is in between the kind of lower and higher uh, end estimates of sea level rise that we might see by the end of the century, the order really flips with 1.2 million people in Florida living on land that low. So a, a very dramatic uptick. Uh, versus a uh, number two slot, California, at um, just several hundred thousand, uh, followed by New Jersey uh, at 260,000. And ranking uh, counties at half a meter, San Mateo County is number one in the country, followed by Marin, followed by Terrebonne uh, in Louisiana. But at one and a half meters, it's Miami-Dade, Broward, and Pinellas, all in Florida. Um, I should add that if we do that by percentage of the population and not the total number, the really big threat is in first and foremost in North Carolina, where in Hyde County, 36% uh, of the population lives less than half a meter above the high tide line. And uh, seven other counties nationwide have more than 10% of their population there. So for more details like this, I want to advertise a tool um, that colleagues and I have built uh, with input from the research community and coastal managers around the country. Uh, it's called Risk Finder. You can find it at riskfinder.org. And you can look up there for whatever zip code, city, county, uh, or state you choose, how many people live on land below different elevation thresholds and, and look at uh, integrated projections of sea level rise and flood risk as well, uh, and, and explore uh, toxic waste sites, uh, infrastructure exposure, and, and great other diversity of things. Um, so to wrap it up, we 
already know a lot about sea level rise. We have a lot more to learn, especially around the ice sheets and how quickly uh, they might decay this century. But um, as the South Florida Sun Sentinel put it in an editorial just a, a month ago or so, at least for some parts of the country, for South Florida, uh, their headline to this editorial launching a, a very special journalistic project in South Florida, an alliance between three papers, the three largest papers, sharing a um, kind of common pool of reporters and stories for a full year. Their, their launching editorial headline was, Sea Level Rise, the Defining Issue of the Century. And uh, there are some places in the United States for which that is absolutely true. Thank you, Ben. Fantastic wrap up. And thank all four of you, uh, first of all, for really very clear presentations. I'm so glad we got to do this with you. Um, for reporters online, uh, if you've got questions, as Josh mentioned, you can type them in the Q&A box there. And um, I will see them here and be able to convey them to the panelists. Um, we already have a couple in, so let me just get started. Um, one is from uh, Mary Landers at the Savannah Morning News. Just a definitional question, but a, a good one to make sure we get our terms right. She's saying she realizes she doesn't really know the difference between iceberg, ice sheet, and glacier. Um, I don't know, maybe Sophie, this is for you. Is there uh, an easy way to keep those things straight, or are they all synonymous? Yeah, no, no, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, so basically, an ice sheet is, when I talk about an ice sheet, I talk about the Greenland and Antarctica as a whole. It's basically this ice that flows over those massive continents. And so they're typically um, a, few, like, a few miles thick, and then they're super, super wide. Um, so like, for example, the full volume of uh, Greenland, if it was melted, could give rise to seven meters of sea level rise, and Antarctica is like 57 or something like that. Um, a glacier um, can be into two forms. There is the glaciers of what you're used to when you go and hike in a national park in the U.S., right? Those um, little glaciers that flow down the mountains. But ice sheets also have glaciers. So for when I talk about the glacier in an ice sheet, it's basically um, those regions of the ice sheet that are flowing very, very, very fast, like a river of ice. Um, now, an iceberg, um, it's basically um, a chunk of um, this ice sheet or this glacier, for me they're the same word, um, that basically has been cut off from um, the main part of the ice sheet. And basically it's cut off because there's been a crack that has developed at the surface and at the bottom. And basically the, 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 the piece, it's a chunk of, um, or imagine an ice cube that you basically chuck up an ice cube and that little thing just keeps on flowing by itself into the sea. And so right now, if you look, uh, I think um, there's beautiful pictures of icebergs flowing um, by uh, in Canada. There's this amazing pictures, I think I saw that on the BBC website or CNN, like really beautiful icebergs flowing on water. And is that basically just ice that has been chucked off from the ice sheet that just, um, and just flowing away onto the water by itself. And a typical Thanks. size could be Manhattan size. Hmm. Uh, a question from Marianne Messina, uh, who I believe is a freelancer, um, wondering what kind of helpful new data are we able to capture when these dramatic events happen where a chunk of ice breaks away um, off of, a, gle off of a, a glacier or an ice sheet? What, what can that teach us? Uh, I'm not sure if that's uh, Andrea or, or Sophie or anyone want to address that. Well, let me just make one comment. Um, uh, when uh, when ice, larger icebergs break away, we sometimes can look at the response of the rest of the ice that's left behind. And uh, some time ago, uh, early in this, in this uh, century, uh, a, a set of icebergs uh, formed at once by the disintegration of an ice shelf from the Larsen ice, Larsen B ice shelf. And its disintegration, uh, this is off the Antarctic Peninsula, which is that thumb that points up to, towards South America. Uh, the, the function of that ice shelf and other ice shelves uh, is to hold, sometimes is to hold the ice 
behind it that's land-based to keep it on the land because the ice shelves themselves as they drift away uh, uh, from the land base as they sort of they're like tongues that drift off the land base ice they get jammed against geological features like rises on the sea floor or the edges of the the bays in which the uh, ice shelves exist but as those fragments and the icebergs that form them break away the, the ice behind those uh, ice shelves that's uh, based on land starts to move faster in fact so one of the uh, very important pieces of information that we picked up by watching the disintegration of this Larsen ice shell is that all the land-based ice in back of it started to accelerate rather rapidly after the ice shelf broke into icebergs and was no longer there. So watching those margins, watch it, what, what happens in response to a change like the break off an, of an iceberg is a very important opportunity for scientists. Hmm. Great. Uh, we have a question here from Kathy Kowalski at Science News for Students saying uh, she could benefit from some better distinction between um, a higher than average sea level rise generally and storm surge generals, uh, storm surge levels in particular. And is there one or the other of those that engineers and policymakers should be giving more weight to for planning purposes? And how should journalists distinguish between those two things for their lay readers? Maybe I'll take a crack at that. Uh, storm surge is really what you have to worry about today. Uh, Sandy had a nine-foot storm surge, and none but the very highest of sea level rise projections get to nine feet anywhere by the end of this century. So, you know, it's possible today to have these events that are, um, you know, much more that, that that are damaging in the short term. Of course, a permanent rise of nine feet would would be drastically more difficult than uh, a, a temporary flood. But really, the challenge is in the combination of sea level rise and storm surge because the truth is that most of our cities probably aren't well designed even for rare big storm surge events as they would naturally occur today with the current sea level or even sea level five inches below where we are today. That we, we already build a lot in the 100-year floodplain, for example. And that problem is only going to get much worse as the sea level continues to rise and we have floods with more and more frequency in areas that aren't accustomed to seeing them and therefore probably haven't been engineered or developed to protect. One metaphor I like to use is um, think of a flood, a damaging flood, a little bit like a dunk in a basketball game. The dunks are hard to get. They don't happen that often. But now imagine somehow the level of the basketball floor, and, and the dunk is the storm surge event. Now imagine the level of the basketball floor was slowly rising, <laughs> but the basket got shorter. Suddenly, you would be getting dunks all the time, and you wouldn't need a lot of rise to accomplish that. And that's how sea level rise and storm surge interact. Great metaphor, thank you. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time, but I want to get at least one more question in, and we might go a couple minutes over if we need to, but we do have a question from uh, Basudev Mahapatra, who's uh, actually a freelance journalist in India, asking a good question of, uh, to what extent does sea level rise potentially affect marine ecosystems and biodiversity uh, and the ecology of the oceans themselves? Someone want to pick that up? One effect is uh, on coral reefs is uh, coral reefs have to uh, keep their tops uh, near the ocean surface as sea level rises. Under certain conditions, uh, it can rise too fast for the coral reefs to keep up. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one example, uh, although coral reefs have a lot of other problems like the warming of the ocean and the acidification itself. Uh, another issue is uh, sea level rise drowns coastal marshes. And under conditions where there wasn't a lot of infrastructure and settlement behind the coast, uh, the, the, the marshes would probably be able to move inland fast enough. But in the developed world, like much of the United States, uh, Australia, Europe, uh, these marshes have nowhere to go. 
Right. Great. And I would add that both marshes are import important for biodiversity, which is what the question asked about, because they some of like the mangroves are nurseries for a lot of the fishes and so forth. And so if you lose those coastal habitats, it will be a very big issue for uh, the biodiversity. Let's take a few more questions and let this stretch a little bit uh, before we close off. Ingfei Chen, a uh, freelancer writing from the West Coast, um, has a question about the map that you showed, Ben, showing interestingly that actually there's some sea level decrease predicted as well along, uh, for example, the coasts of Alaska and Western Canada. What's what's that about? Yeah, that's that's about um, the land there in some areas of Alaska is rising more quickly than the sea level is rising. So even though the if you took the absolute elevation of the water surface, it is going up. The elevation of the land is going up faster, and so the effect on a uh, tide gauge, that what kind of water level measuring device on the shore, would it would make it seem like the water level was going down. And the reason why behind a lot of vertical land motion in general has to do with uh, the Earth's slow response to changes since the last ice age. Uh, Ice sheets, and there used to be a massive ice sheet covering um, most of Canada and, and you know, with incursions into uh, the United States 10,000 years ago, are extremely heavy, and they compress the earth underneath them. I think of it a little bit like a person sitting on a mattress. The person is the ice sheet, and the mattress is the earth underneath. When a person sits down on a mattress, the mattress compresses under the person. And when the person gets up, the mattress, that section that was under him, springs back up. And that's what's happening in Alaska. Now, in other areas that weren't under the person, when the person sits down on the mattress, the part under him goes down, but the part away from him actually goes up like a lever. And when he gets up, that part away sinks back down. And so that sinking back down is what's happening in most of the United States which wasn't under an ice sheet uh, in the last ice age. Great. Um, one more question. We'll go to about five after here. Um, Mary Landers, again, at uh, Savannah Morning News, uh, wants to follow up on your statement. I think this was, uh, Michael, this might have been you. Six inches of sea level rise could translate to about 50 feet less beach, at least in some parts of the East Coast. Uh, she's wondering if these kinds of calculations are available for specific areas uh, for reporters who want to report on what's going to predictably happen right where they are, and how reliable are those kinds of uh, statistics? Uh, so that particular uh, 100 to 1 ratio is something called the Brune rule. It's very rough and kind of tries to uh, accommodate all the different situations at all the beaches around the world. and. Uh, in order to really get a usable local answer, what I would do is talk to the folks at your nearby Institute of Oceanography, for instance, and some of them have done local estimates of what happens on particular beaches. It's not easy to do. The models are difficult because you have to take account of many factors at once. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know of any global, I, I know of global databases on overall beach loss, but when you get down to the particular level uh, that you might be interested in, you really need to go to, to regional or local experts who may have done the specific modeling. Yeah, and I might just... There's information and historical loss. If you're interested in future loss, you have to use the modeling, and that's, more, that, that's where the problem comes. Yeah, I, 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 I might add, um, I, I feel like I've read that most beaches that are um, visited by tourists in Florida are, have actually been nourished, replenished with, with sand that's brought in. And I wouldn't be surprised if the same were the case in Georgia. So it's not a projection, but if you snooped around, you might find that most any beach that is um, you know, important in your area is, is, is already being replenished with sand. And if that's the case, it would be an indicator that a threat is underway and it's actually being counteracted. Um, there are other questions about how, how sustainable and how, how much we can keep up by replenishing uh, the sand on beaches artificially. Great. 
I'm going to uh, give one more question here, and this is coming from uh, Kevin Luria at Business Insider, and it relates to your uh, point, Andrea, earlier that uh, the records indicate that when temperatures were about, you know, what they are now, sea levels were 20 to 30 feet higher um, than they are now. So the question is, does that indicate that basically that much change is built in, that we're going to get there, um, and that the only real question at this point is how quickly or is there still room to, um, to prevent or change that, that kind of outcome? Right, so that's a great question. And that example I passed, as we mentioned before, is not necessarily going to be a perfect analog for what we see in the future, but we did see a repeated pattern of getting that. So it's reasonable to assume that we're going to get a lot of that sea level rise, all based on the amount of uh, temperature rise that we have already seen. But, for example, one of the ways in which that past time period is not analogous to today is that right now we're heating our atmosphere by adding greenhouse gases, which increases the temperatures at both poles of the Earth simultaneously. And that was not the same forcing mechanism that we saw in the past, where it was kind of one pole at a time, so it was being heated by variations in the orbit of the Earth around the sun. And so I, what I sometimes say to people is actually it could be worse because now we're forcing Greenland and Antarctica at the same time, whereas before there was a little bit of a what we call bipolar seesaw, it's a playoff between the two poles, one getting heated and the other one. Um, but certainly it gives you the idea that these ice sheets are, as we said before, very sensitive to what you might think of as a very small change in global mean temperature. Remember, though, if you drop temperature by 4 degrees Celsius global mean, that's what happened during the last ice age. So four degrees doesn't sound like a lot unless you're sitting under a couple miles of ice, you know, in New York City or in Canada or wherever you are. So the small temperature changes can mean big things for the Earth's ice. Gives real new meaning to the Goldilocks zone uh, that we're living in. I want to thank you all for uh, a fantastic set of, of presentations. Um, thanks to the reporters for logging in and for doing everything you do to get the best evidence out there into your stories. I want to encourage you all to follow us at SciLine at at Real SciLine. And to check out our website at SciLine.org for more information about how we can help you as you do your reporting, uh, finding you the best experts and expertise and contextual information to help you get more of that actual good scientific evidence into every story that you write. Thanks, everybody, for participating, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again at the next Sideline Media Briefing.